Next up, we have a really special guest because uh, he already uh, he he came also um, the the first uh, Transformers at Work event. Hacking Face was a bit smaller by that time, but uh, but uh, yeah, we're we're really happy to have seen it uh, grow so much. So Thomas Wolf, uh, uh, you might know him as a Chief Science Officer at the Hacking Face. He leads the research there, and uh, we're really happy to uh, have him. So uh, please, I would I would also uh, yeah. I think the I think the background from Thomas is, is too uh, too long in variety to list. So uh, <laughs> I'm gonna let you uh, yeah pick that. Uh, okay. Work. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Happy to see you again after this uh, short uh, COVID break uh, between the first and the second transform at work. Uh, it's the first live conference for me in a long time, so it's also uh, very nice to do that again. It's so much better than online stuff, honestly. Um, so I want to talk today about something we've been doing this year. We do one project per year at Hugging Face. It's pretty simple. In 2019, we did Transformers. 2020, we did Dataset Library. And this year, we did Big Science. And next year, uh, I still don't know. So if you have a nice project you want to do, you can reach out. We can do it together. Uh, so as you might have noticed, there have been a couple of large language models around. Uh, and basically, it's a recent train in NLP, right, that people kind of uh, dive in this uh, addiction of training larger language model on larger data sets. Uh, but the people who are mostly addicted are in industry. Uh, so the one that started this addiction are OpenAI. Uh, we've uh, recently the GPT-3. And so what they discover is that if you train a very large language model on a very large data set, you have some an interesting phenomenon related to few shots and zero shot learning. And this appears only if you have something big enough to uh, like to, to, to start to have I mean, some significant. Uh, so this is one example of, of, of the paper, but they, they kind of tested zero shot and one shot in, in, a, lot, in a lot of tasks. Um, and since uh, this was interesting, a number of other companies started to train large language model. Um, so there was uh, actually a number of startups that was uh, created on the basis of training this large language model. So the most recent are, are Coher that, that you might have seen uh, maybe last week, I think, or even this week, I don't know, the, the deep learning world goes so fast. Uh, so this week of last week, they raised 40 million to train large language model and kind of democratize them through a, a closed API. <clears throat> and then there is another one, which is AI21. <laughs> which is also training a massive language model that's, I think, slightly bigger than GPT-3, uh, which is also democratizing with, with a closed API. Uh, and then Anthropic is kind of taking the same role, I think, uh, with a lot of money. What is funny about Anthropic is that it's founded by, by the people who trained the, the GPT-3, right? It's a part of the, the research team of OpenAI that kind of left uh, and decided to create their own, their own research endeavor. And they also raised a lot of money, right? And uh, a bunch of uh, Korean, Korean companies, so this is uh, Huawei, I think, and Naver trained, uh, I think, two different language models, which are also about this size. And, uh, and obviously, Google also have this kind of ties internally. So there is a lot of companies. Well, you, you might notice that the main problem is that all these things are kind of closed. Through. So for a researcher, in particular, in academia, it doesn't really solve the problem of like accessing them, the research on them, and these kind of things. And there is a number of issues with having like most of the research now on the on this on this language model do conduct it in private settings. So I mean, some of them are just because it's private, but I think some of them are more general research question. Like these models usually are not really designed as a general research tool. So uh, if you want to use even the API when they're accessible to researcher, you, you don't have access to the train data very often. So if you want to know if what you're testing is actually out of domain or in domain generalization, most of the time you just don't know. So you, you, you're like, okay, maybe it's zero shot or maybe it's just giving me back something from training data. I don't know, data. A lot of research questions that people have been investigating on, even the smaller model like Bird GPT, they are asked after the model is trained. So people are like, oh, now we have this artifact. Let kind of try to understand it. Uh, but maybe it would be even better to ask this question before. Like, uh, we want to build a big, big model like this. What are the interesting research questions? And can we actually save the artifact we would need to answer the question? 
Um, they are very often Anglo-centric. Most of these models are English models. Uh, it's very difficult for academic researchers to be involved in this research. It's very difficult. It's, uh, I don't think I've seen up to now any involvement of real academic researchers in these in this trainings. Um, there's a little bit of like a diversity, I think, in the, in the research team who build them, just because they are like limited size. Even if there are 40 people, they can't just cover all the area where this model will be used later. Of course, like all the social researcher could be involved in this as well, I think, for social uh, fields. There is a couple of questions about environmental training, since they're all private. Now we keep training them separately by all this entity kind of train similar model, because basically they're all kind of transformers, right? The architecture is the simplest possible. They're all kind of the same model, but we keep training them just because they're all private. So that's also a little bit stupid. I mean, that was the, the reason we started creating transformers was like, we thought, oh, BERT is so expensive to train. We should avoid that people retrain it and we should share it. Um, and now we have the things which are like 10,000 more ex expensive to train and, and they are still private. So we, we still don't share them and keep retraining them. Um, and then there is a couple of shortcomings that people have started to see in the text corpora that are used to train this model. Uh, because uh, we're all kind of guilty of being more interested in models than, than data. Uh, the, the data set that are used to train this model, they, they are not the best one we could do, right? They have a lot of like, they are not, not representative of population. If you look at the vocabulary of GPT-2, uh, I mean, the, the base vocabulary, you have like words like uh, names of Redditor and you're like, if this is the next AGI, should, that, should it has like the name of Redditors in its base vocabulary as a base vector? And I'm like, no. So basically there is a lot of things that are not really studied deeper in, in deep enough details, I think, that could be better. But because the people who develop them are just too small, also you can't do everything. If you're focusing on models, you can't spend your time on data. Uh, we're kind of not asking this question. So there have been a couple of more uh, open initiatives. I think the first one was uh, Eluter, which kind of started uh, in reply to uh, OpenAI not wanting to open source. I think it was GPT-2 at the time. Um, and they have been training models uh, and releasing them open. Like the, the, the most recent one is uh, 6 billion and they are, they are on the way to train bigger model. So OpenAI is kind of an open like Discord forum where everybody can join. It's kind of like a, a Reddit basically. Um, at the beginning of the year, we started the Big Science Research Workshop, which is what I'm going to talk about uh, to you, which is uh, a little bit different than Eluter in that it's kind of focused on involving academia, which I think academia was a little bit scared about Eluter because of all, all these hacker everywhere. And so we decided to make something a little bit more tailored for them. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully they feel better in this kind of uh, standard thing. Uh, and more recently this summer, there was an initiative at Stanford which is called the Center for Research and Foundation Models. And they did a workshop and the idea is a little bit the same. It's kind of like a, um, a group of academia from Stanford studying this model and kind of wanting to do that um, in, a more, in a more community way, though it's still kind of Stanford community. So <laughs> I'm a very caustic, I'm a, I'm a bit sorry. I will try to be more friendly to all these people now. <laughs> I'm not used to live talk anymore. So uh, what was the idea of big science? Um, because also what I, what I should mention is that uh, big science kind of has people from all these entities. So it's very open. We have people from Eliter, we have people from Stanford and we kind of all working together. We even have people from all these uh, companies here like from Coair, from Anthropic in big science. So um, what was the big science idea? Well, the big science come from the fact that I'm originally a physicist. Uh, I was doing uh, research in physics and in physics where we have stuff that are too expensive for lab, what we do is that we gather the labs together and they build, uh, and they build big experiments. So like the, the good example is the Large Hadron Collider, um, which has involved more than 10,000 researchers. So it's really huge. And for our field, which has a lot of papers, it's also great because you can generate a lot of papers here. So that's so very deep learning and friendly. Uh, <laughs> and in many fields, actually, you have this like large scale research collaboration. So LHC that you might know is about fusion, fusion uh, research. You have also, uh, oh, sorry, uh, LHC is the, the Large Hadron Collider. ITER is about fusion research. You also have the International Space Station, which is also a very, very uh, successful like international collaboration. 
And so the question was, maybe it's time to do the same in AI and NLP today, like gather all this, this team in something that is open, that is uh, also uh, mixing industry and academia, and try to see if all these people can actually train a model together. And why could you do that? Because if you look at, you have actually a lot of large scale public compute, which is um, available. So in France, we have this Genzai supercomputer, which is a, a great one, but you have, you have a, several of this type in, in Europe. Um, and if you look at the, like the, the, uh, like the specification, it's like 2,700 uh, V100 GPU. So it's actually powerful enough to train one of these uh, large language models. So, and these one are typically free. You know, just need to apply for a grant of uh, ours. So why not get together and apply for a grant? So that's what we did. Uh, in January, I was talking a lot with the um, uh, Gen C is like the builder of this supercomputer, Idris, they are the operator. And so we talked together and I was like, why not doing a very big project in Europe? And so very quickly, like uh, the, the science team of uh, Hugging Face was on board. Well, I'm the boss, so they were quickly on board. They had no choice. They were like, what? <laughs> what's, what's this stuff? And then the French Academy was, uh, French Academy committee was, was very interested. And so we, we filled in a grant application for 5 million GPU hours. Uh, which kind of was a little bit uh, annoying for people because it was more than what they give to every project every six months. So we asked for everything, uh, basically. <laughs> but it, it was resolved quite nicely because they will just actually uh, very likely uh, increase the size of the supercomputer. So it's actually a bonus for everyone. We will have a more, uh, a more uh, big, a bigger public supercomputer at the end. And so uh, the grant was accepted. And the, and the project of officially started in the beginning of May. Uh, we had like a, a kickoff event at the end of April. And, and we have a few uh, live events. So, uh, so how is its structure? Well, first, I mean, let me explain you, but I, I already explained a bit the idea, right? The idea is that we, we want to investigate these large models, this large data set. Uh, we think that uh, behind the fact that they are, they are difficult to access, they, they do have many interesting research questions that you can pose, pose around them. I mean, it's, there is some limits uh, that I think are interesting around what you can just learn with just text only. I think these models have been really challenging what we thought we could learn with text only. Uh, for a lot of people, we, we needed to move to databases or like more thing to have like more knowledge, but things that we don't actually. Uh, there is the, the interesting question about what is actually an NLP task where you don't even have a data set needed to define it. Um, and then there is a lot of question. I talk a little bit about fairness and that and the, and the question around this model. And so this idea was like, let's gather everyone. Uh, let's gather uh, the, the full research community. Let's try to list all the research questions we would like to answer in advance. So let's see, okay, I want to investigate generation versus memorization. What do I need as artifact? I need checkpoints during the training. So let's be sure we keep this. Let's be sure we can link them to the training data set so I can see which points are, are memorized. The same for social question, like let's investigate the memorization of personal identifying information, for instance, which is a big problem with these models. They can memorize stuff you don't want sometimes. Uh, and let's just try to, in advance, prepare the thing we need so that we can actually answer as many questions as we can. And we can actually, with a single model, make it as useful as we can to, to, some, to as many people as possible, right? And, and the, the, big, the big goal of the project is to try to ask as many questions as possible a priori rather than as a posteriori how we've been doing up to now. There is a second aspect, which is creating, um, creating and sharing these artifacts. So there is one artifact will be this very large multilingual data set. And here we try to do that uh, a little bit better than what has been done. So like there's a lot of research in uh, how we can make this data set more ethically, like involving more the people, like the, the stakeholders about uh, on, on the data, how we can share them in a more open way. Uh, and so here we can try to um, create a large data set that, that would be actually something super useful because it would be uh, more clean and more easier to, to access. Then there is obviously the, the very large multilingual uh, language model. So here the idea is to make it multilingual because the same idea, we want to make it as useful as possible for as many people as possible. A lot of people are not doing research on English. A lot of people are doing uh, NLP research in other language. So let's make it multilingual. And then there is kind of a, the meta question around we're doing like open science in common uh, uh, together, I mean, as a community, is it something that's possible to replicate in the future? Is it, is it an interesting direction? And so we try to document how it's happening, what are the pain points, 
uh, how can people do that uh, and what should be better in the future. Um, and so the, the structure of this is, is quite interesting because it has become so big, it's like 600 people now, uh, that uh, we could not really do like a consortium like people do uh, usually, which is also fine for me because I didn't want to dive in I, like IP question with 50 entities, or there, there is more than 50 entities, there is like 250 entities, I think. Uh, and so what we have decided is to, to structure it uh, as a workshop. So it means it's very, um, it's very kind of fluid, like people participate in a kind of a community voluntary basis, just like when you organize a workshop with other people, you like spend a little bit of your time uh, on, see, on this. Uh, and so it's online for one year and we do a, a few live session events. So we've done two up to now and we have a next one in, in September. And every time in the live session, we have like one, one day and people present what they've been doing in the various working group. And we also use that to publish papers. So I said that it's inclusive for academia. So inclusive for academia means you, you need to be able to publish paper because that's kind of your, your reward. So we are very careful about that. Um, yeah, and so today it's about 600 people um, from about 50 countries. Uh, there's a lot of institution uh, involved. Um, as I told you, yeah, it's on this supercomputer. Um, and it's actually organized in a, in a lot of working groups. So you have working group on, on also some aspect that people don't really care about usually like carbon footprint, biomedical domain. Uh, we have a meta group on like social impact, which gathering people from all this working group and saying, okay, what is the social impact about our decision in modeling, about our decision in evaluation? In various things, so evaluation, you also have like things that you don't see very often, like bias, fairness, uh, multilinguality. We try to be sure that we won't overfit on English and that our like evaluation and creation will be, I would say, multilingual from the start. So these are all the, the current working group. Um, just show you a little bit of some of them. The, the modeling group also has a research question, which is, can we improve the prompting behavior? So if you've played with this very large language model, you usually write a prompt and the model kind of complete it. And the way you write your prompt is, the model is usually very sensi sensitive to the way you write your prompt, which is kind of a typical failure. Like you will, I don't know, use a, use a comma that's not uh, expected by the model and it's kind of lost. Or like there is some, some, some weird thing that are unpre unpredictable sometimes. And so here the idea was to try to um, make this behavior more, more robust. The more robust to the prompting behavior. Uh, they have a lot of other aspects they are investigating, like multilinguality, scaling laws, um, using uh, metadata to put speech in context. Uh, the group on data set has been uh, conducting a lot of uh, work on governance, how you can gather data set uh, following the various law. How can we get a big data set, which is at the same time kind of ethical and legal, and how can we host it? In a, in a place which is kind of typically, if you know, like uh, ML commands, data set commands, data commands, these are the idea. They do a lot of work on sourcing and tooling. Uh, tokenization is a big question when you're multilingual, you don't want to mess it up. Um, so there is quite a lot of question around here. Uh, visualization, just like also in the LHC, you have a lot of cool visualization. Um, we have one working group on, on visualization, which is working on training dynamics mostly, which I think is super interesting as well, because here we have really access, everybody has access to the training of the, of the model, so we can really try to see what's happening there. In relation to multilinguality as well, like do, you, do we learn one language first or like faster than other? Uh, evaluation is a huge question for this large language model. There's a lot of aspects. You have task-based evaluation on, on like downstream tasks. Uh, you have interesting like perplexity and robustness, well, all this kind of thing. Uh, we have this working group I told you about social impact, which is kind of different than, than what we have usually, which is right now kind of criticizing a little bit because we are not as diverse as we could have been. Apparently, it's actually super difficult to, to, to do these things well. Um, but it's also very nice to have uh, like this working group inside. Uh, engineering scaling is a huge question because we need to scale this stuff at the end. So uh, that's the most active one. Um, and um, I think maybe a, a last uh, thing about what's coming next. So right now we finished the training of uh, the first model, which is the 13 billion. Uh, it's an English only model for this one, which was designed to investigate kind of instabilities at scale. Uh, well, the answer is that we didn't see any instabilities. It was actually quite simple to, to train. 
Um, we're now discussing the next model, which will be probably a little bit the same, but multilingual. And then in the beginning of next year, we train the final one, which is expected to be like 200 billion or something multilingual model. In the meantime, we might have time to train a third model. And uh, there is a lot of a lot of working group have been like working on papers and survey around their various areas. We also have generated a data set that will be published around prompt behavior. And if you want to know basically more about all the things that people have been doing, um, you can join episode two, which is uh, September 20th. It will be online and we are co-located with INLG, which is a conference uh, in, uh, in UK. Um, we have nice speakers uh, from Massacre and from also the Stanford Initiative uh, and from various working group. So I think that was my last slide, yeah. So we have a website that I'm trying to refactor a bit. So it's quite ugly right now, but if you want to, to see the ugly, ugly version before I refactor it this summer, you can run now to see it quickly. <laughs> uh, we have a Twitter account because uh, today Twitter in deep learning is important. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. It's really interesting. So do we have questions? All right, let's go. Uh, how do you make decisions? Because yeah. you, you have only one training, you said. Yeah, that's a good question. So all these working groups, they have chairs. So they're organized with like president of working group. And the chairs are a bit organizing. And we have like, um, Every two weeks, we meet with all the chairs and, and we take decisions. So right now, it's starting to be a bit more complex. So what we, are, what we have been settling just, just actually yesterday is some requests for comments. So when we have like a decision that impacts a lot of people, they can write down for the, for the second model, for instance, they're like, we want to train this model. Here are the pro, the cons, and everyone can comment for one week, and then we take a decision. Up to now, it has been surprisingly pretty easy to take decision. Uh, I think the scale also make a lot of things very kind of difficult. So we kind of settle often on the simpler thing. So yeah. But yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question. It's working quite well, I think, because <laughs> it's maybe academia, I don't know, people are kind of used to collaborate. So they are like discuss and uh, it's very polite. <laughs> like, um, are you going to have 600 authors on your paper? And, <laughs> and if not, how do you decide uh, who is going to be on it? No, yeah, that's a good question. That's also the reason we have a lot of working groups, because actually each working group will, will, will publish with just the people who are inside. And, and that's a lot smaller, usually. Uh, and even in them, I mean, some of them are really big, but not everyone is active on everything. Like, I think data set and modeling are both like 180 people. But the day-to-day -day people, you know, like when you organize something, right, you have 200 people, but day-to-day -day you have like 10 people who are really active. So um, we, we, we're already having like uh, data governance is preparing first, well, a lot of them are actually preparing first papers or review, uh, and it's working pretty well. What we did is that we, we collaborated with a rolling review, so we can have like a per review as part of the, of the workshop. So everyone can have like their, their paper published easily, I would say. And at the end, we might have indeed a very big paper, but yeah, that would be more like a closing paper after everyone has talked about what they've been doing. Great, another one? Yeah, I was curious if the end model will be available and how. Yeah, so that's the goal, right? We want to make something available. Um, uh, so um, what, we, what we also want uh, is to make it also easy to use on smaller workstations. So, so if right now we are starting to make decision around this, how can we make a model which is easy to use uh, for researcher in like uh, when you have just one or two GPU, right? So uh, that's something, but, but the, the end model will be freely available. And our goal would be really that the data set could be also as easily as available. So that's more difficult, I say a lot more because around model, the, I would say legal aspects are still quite blurry and you can still say now, you've seen that with Copilot or Codex or people are like, now nah, this is not really a, a copy of the training data set. So the, uh, but around the data, like the, the data, the, the law is, is, more, is more difficult to, to use. So what we use in some places like research fair use, so it might be only usable by researchers. That, that might be some, some limits to the data set, for instance. I saw some more hands around here. Um, 
you said that your big goal is the 200 billion model. Um, are you going to, do you have an end goal in mind or are you going to say after we've achieved that we want to continue or are you just going to dissolve after that? Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it's also a little bit, it's also a workshop because workshops are often reconducted. So uh, the idea is that if people like that, well, for me, it was very tiring. So I think I will probably stop, but uh, just like workshop, you know, people stop after the one, the first one. But uh, if people want to reconduct, reconduct it, that's possible. Typically like, I don't know, multi multimodality, people are talking about that. That could be also interesting. Uh, and it's it's not exactly sure I could be on around the same cluster or, or but yeah, I think Skype open. Hmm. Some more questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the great work. Uh, so I uh, like I want to know how what your plans are for uh, handling misinformation or uh, retracted works. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so on the data set, we want to be able to handle people who want to, to remove some some uh, elements. So so here, it, it's might be possible that the data set um, that's nice because we have a lot of people in like biomedical field and they actually also have this question. And very often there, they have like portals where you, where you can log to access the data set. And so the data set is kind of in one place and you can remove a part of it. So probably the, the data set might be like accessible in one place like this. So we can control and, and remove some place if people want to remove something. Uh, removing information from a model is like an open uh, research question. I don't think we will be able to solve it. There is a lot of things where, I mean, this is a really a research workshop. So uh, we won't, I mean, we won't solve the ethics in AI problem in, in one year. We, we don't think we will be able. What we just want is make like a meaningful progress or like have at least a platform where we can investigate some of these questions. Like for instance, we try to remove personal identifying information. We know we won't be able to remove them all, but if there is some of them still, it's interesting because you can understand where they come from and maybe you can like trace more this memorization question that usually we can't trace because we don't have access to both the model and the training data set. So here you will have both. So it will really be a tool for research, but the idea is not like uh, jump on this to use it in your application if we have the same limitation in the current model. I'll do two last questions. Uh, how do you distribute the GPU budget? So, so this is like decision we take together. Um, we've decided to assign, so we have a limited budget. Five million looks like a lot, but it's actually uh, just just what we need to train a, a multilingual. Multilinguality does also mean we, we might need to use more tokens than a monolingual model. Um, but yeah, we, we decide together what next model we train. And then there is still some open, like an, an open thing for like all the smaller hyperparameter search. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of working group are also doing like hyperparameter hyper search and training small models. So we decided that 20% of the budget can be used for that. So yeah, it's pretty okay right now. Last question. Thanks. Um, two questions actually. The first one is, <laughs> is um, yeah, not so sophisticated, but I'm really curious. Who and how did you come up with uh, Hugging Face, the company name? And the second one is, um, what you could you um, start a community-driven conference? Uh, just in the yeah, uh, next stage, it's really hard. It's getting harder to uh, getting papers accepted at the well-known AI uh, or ML conferences. And um, just big companies like you said, Google and Facebook, they um, yeah, they, they just uh, taking taking over. And having such a community, community-driven conference where it's also uh, where, where it's easier to publish, yeah, that would be awesome. And I see you guys as the yeah right people for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but the name, uh, I mean, Hugging Face has a complex history as well. It started as a chatbot company actually, uh, and, uh, and at that time we wanted a name that uh, was kind of friendly to the game, uh, and we thought if if one day we do an IPO, which at that time seems like like a kind of crazy blurry thing. Uh, um, we thought it would be nice to have a, like an emoji, you know, as a NASDAQ. Uh, thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> it might still happen. I mean, it, it's more uh, realistic now than it was when we were a chatbot company. Uh, and about community conference. Yeah, I think, I think, honestly, I think like research conference and research workshop are one of the most uh, efficient and, and, uh, and beautiful way of collaborating in science. It's just working well, you know, like, you have all these researchers, they go together, they make a workshop, 
they make super nice brainstorm, super nice exchange for, for free, basically, right? It's not, uh, and this works well. And that was also one of the inspiration of making it as a research workshop. That's something that's worked well as a form of, co of collaboration in science. And it's super open. Like in a workshop, you have typically people coming from all over the world, right? In a consortium, you just have your big, big tech friends, which is also a bit sad, I think. 